And welcome to today's webinar, part of the WWF One Planet Leader Series, leading by example, Nestle. Thank you much for joining us today. Therese is delighted to have Klaus Konzelman of Nestle and Elise Manyana of WWF with us. Before we begin the actual presentation today, I'd like to give a few technical instructions for this webinar. If you have any problems with the technology or audio during the session, please use the chat box on the hand side to send a message to me. Select from the drop-down menu, send your message, and then get back to you. you to ask questions throughout the entire presentation, and we'll hold a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. To type your question, go into the Q&A box on the bottom right-hand side of your screen, and then press send. If you to connect through your phone, use your box and contact me for the details. Now out of the way, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Elise. Lisa. Yeah, here. Thank you, Vanessa, and hello, everybody. Welcome to the One Planet webinar. My name is Elise Magnana, and I will be your host for today's session. I work for WWF, and I'm part of the One Planet Leaders Team. We run a training program for business on sustainability and change. And this webinar series is one of the activities we organize with two degrees for free and ongoing learning opportunities. So, we'll be we have different themes in our webinar series. Leading example, changing times, leading together, and leading with the heart. And the stuff today is leading by example. And we will discover how Nestle has adopted the concept of shared value as a core part of their business. Shared value is a, recently, uh, uh, is a relatively recent concept that seeks to go beyond corporate social responsibility. The idea behind creating shared value is that the success of a company and the well-being of the communities around it are mutually dependent. If it is possible to create economic values in a way that also creates value for society by addressing its needs and challenges. But what does it mean in practice? And how can, can a large company like Nestle embed the concept of shared values deep into its business? Can make how can it make a positive difference to the communities where it operates? So to answer to all these questions and probably many others that you may will have, we are really delighted to welcome Klaus Kuhlmann, the President, Head and Safety of Head of Safety, Health and Environmental Sustainability at Nestle. So Klaus, thank you so much for being with us today. And before I give you the floor, let me share a few information about yourself to the audience. Klaus Hulman has been driving Nestle's performance in workplace health and safety since 2004. He is a member of the World Economic Forum Project Board, Sustainability for Tomorrow's Consumer. He joined Nestle in 1991 and has various strategic and operational positions in Switzerland, Germany, and Australia. Klaus has a PhD in molecular biology from Manchester University and worked previously in the agrobiotech se sector and as a science journalist. So Klaus, thank you so much for accepting our invitation, and I will hand over to you now. Well, thanks for your kind words, uh, Elise, and also Vanessa, for giving us the opportunity here to share some of our activities. I guess there is probably not a big need to introduce Nestle in any great detail. Most of you will probably know that Nestle is the world's largest food and beverage company. Just maybe a few key figures. We have a very diverse product portfolio, also geographically very diverse. We are manufacturing our products in almost 500 factories in 83 countries, have about 300, 330,000 employees with a turnover of approximately 90 billion U.S. dollars. We will celebrate, in fact, our uh, first 150 years of existence, and one of our really core principles is managing for the long term, managing for the next 150 years, not just for the next quarter. Never compromise the long-term development of our business for short-term gains, and in our articles of association, which is in a way the, the company's uh, equivalent of a of a um, country's constitution, 
Uh, and I quote, we say, Nestle Shell, in pursuing its business purpose, aim for long-term sustainable value creation, end of quote. Nevertheless, we also produce a solid profitability in the short term. We have increased the uh, EBIT margin and uh, dividends uh, for the past 50 years, year after year. We're amongst the top 50 most valuable companies by market capitalization. And uh, just recently, I read a study where someone calculated that any shareholder who invested 10,000 Swiss francs in the year I happened to be born, which is 1959, would have earned 1.8 million Swiss francs through dividends and share price increase today. A uh, nice return of 18,000% uh, over these 53 years. So consider saving up for your retirement. Buying some Nestle shares may not be a bad idea indeed. Now, on our uh, business model, how are we doing that? Let's first uh, talk a bit about the context and the first context part obviously is uh, the consumer. We are in a uh, consumer business and first and foremost all we do is focusing on the consumer and her needs. The first need in food obviously is taste uh, and increasingly obviously also whether the food is healthy which sometimes is similar to a square circle because often taste is associated with fat, sugar and salt. So we have been deploying significant research and development efforts uh, in more than 30 R&D centers around the world to develop food that is both tastier and healthier. And what's it for me as a consumer personally, consumers increasingly are interested also in the where does the food come from, what are the working conditions, for example, things like, do I support child labor uh, through my purchases? And then, as well, how the food is made, what was the impact on the environment and on limited resources? In fact, most consumers may say that these items are or aspects are important for them, but they're not necessarily ready to pay more, certainly not in the mainstream business. Uh, so hence, another squaring of the circle we have to make products that are not only tastier and healthier and more sustainable, but we should do all of that at the same price. And that's why the importance of the supply chain optimization becomes ever more important uh, in this line of business. There are still lots of inefficiencies, and the company's role today is no longer just to buy raw materials and ingredients, but also to help suppliers and especially the farmers to become more efficient and at the same time also more sustainable. We're not only looking at today's consumer, I think an important part of any long-term oriented company is also to prepare for the future, never mind what the current consumer's preferences might be. And the context certainly also has evolved here. While even a few years ago, the planet seemed to be limitless, and I think it's now clear to most of us that due to growth of population, of affluence, of purchasing power, which is obviously great, and it's great for business like ours, at the same time, our resources are overused, or more positively speaking, not used efficiently enough in many parts of the world. So the food industry sees clear limits to example, to support the projected growth in our daily business alone, we would need milk, or we, we do need milk, from an additional 100,000 cows every year, which we need to add on to our supply chain. And as the largest user of agricultural raw materials, we, we purchase almost about 1% of traded farm output, we are certainly uh, and have been become acutely aware of these constraints. Now, our vision is to uh, guide our activities through the notion that 7 billion people eat well, which obviously is expected to even increase to 9 billion people by 2050, mm -hmm. and that within the limits of the planet. Uh, and this vision obviously is inspired by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, of which we are a founding member. Let's now focus on the two aspects of uh, scarcities. One, obviously, is planetary boundaries, 
where on one hand we've got availability of inputs, fertile land and soil, clean water, the ecosystem services we all depend on. On the other hand, we also have to look at our outputs of our activities, which creates increased stress on these ecosystem services from which we benefit, especially in the food industry. Because like some other business sectors, almost all of our input, input materials and raw materials and ingredients come from nature. Uh, and so already today, humanity uses more resources than would be sustainable, uh, most notably in those three highlighted categories here, biodiversity loss, nitrogen absorption capacity of the soils of the ecosystems through fertilizers, through, through farming activities mainly, and also greenhouse gases. And obviously, according to other sources, also freshwater use is exceeding sustainable levels by approximately 10% already today, which is expected to increase to about 40% within the next 20 years or so. So please keep this context in mind. I will revert a little later uh, what that may mean for us as a company. The aspect is scarcities. Uh, and here, despite a rapidly growing world population, we actually are confronted with a scarcity of farmers. Farming is not attractive enough in emerging countries in particular. There is a scarcity of good, for example, cocoa trees. Uh, um, the, 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 the tree stock is getting older. There is scarcity of technical assistance to help those farmers that do stay on their land to improve. Uh, there is scarcity of credit to farmers as well. More people live in cities and in rural areas, and this trend certainly will continue. The question is, do we as a society value agriculture and food enough? There's been a race for ever cheaper products. At the same time, a third of the food in industrialized uh, countries is actually thrown away. We have been very close to farmers since the very beginning of our company as an infant nutrition and milk company, and this proxy to farmers indirectly even led to one of the most important innovations uh, which we have made over the past few decades, which is soluble coffee. And uh, I, maybe I appreciate the, the, the story, even if it's an old one, but it's not well known and has many learnings even for today and for tomorrow. In fact, it was in the 1920s long before globalization, when we built the first factory in Latin America, which was in Brazil at the time, it was a milk powder factory. The context at the time there also was that there were big coffee surpluses. The prices have declined then. Coffee was even dumped into the Atlantic because it couldn't be sold. Coffee farms got bankrupt. And then there was a government official. Uh, he was actually at the inauguration of our milk powder factory uh, who had this idea. He said, well, you turn highly perishable raw material, fresh milk, into a stable product, milk powder, that can be stored for months or even years. Couldn't you do something similar also with coffee to balance the high volatility between years of bumper harvest on the one hand side and then again years of low production? The story shows that sometimes it can be quite useful to listen to government officials even as an inspiration for new business ideas. Uh, just to remind you, Nestle was not at all in the coffee business uh, at, at that time, but had taken up that uh, idea, and after a few years of research and development, then created uh, Nescafe, which also significantly expanded the opportunities to farmers uh, to, to sell their products through increased consumption. So it shows why the food industry is so necessary in particular in the age of urbanization, namely to bridge the gap between the rural and the urban areas. You need efficient supply chains, you need processing that preserves the nutritional value and in particular that minimizes uh, spoilage. But turning to the next point, which is traditional economic wisdom and how all that fits together. Traditional economic wisdom suggests that short-term shareholder value maximization is the only valid objective for companies. As Milton Friedman already re remarked in 1970, the business of business is business. Now, traditionally, and I think that's really the difference, business was mainly focused on return on invested capital, not the financial return on invested financial capital. 
to leading capital is also look at the societal returns on invested capital. Questions are, for example, how does a financial investment, for example, build a factory in Africa, as we have been scaling up over the last few years, enhance also societal value? There are answers like creating new jobs, which can easily be, easily be counted and uh, calculated. But that goes deeper. It, for example, bringing business principles, sound business principles, government structures, know-how, training, investment in supply chains, and so on. And the next, layer, the next dimension around it is this notion of natural capital, where on one hand we ask, well, how does business benefit from natural capital from the ecosystem services such as clean water, fertile land, pollination, and so on. But at the same time also, how do we as business impact that natural capital? Now at Nestle, we have framed all these uh, trends together. And if you want to be in the business for the long term, and it is part of sustainability, that's in fact how we define sustainability, that long-term orientation, the seeming conflict between shareholders and stakeholders eventually fades away. In fact, the longer, the longer term your horizon is, the more interests of financial capitalists and societal capitalists converge. No business can thrive for long in a failed society, and no business can thrive for another 150 years in a degraded environment. And we call this integrated view, looking to trust financial returns, creating shared value, which is based on the seminal work by Professor Michael Porter and Mark Kramer at Harvard. We strongly believe that for any company to be successful in the long term, it must create value, certainly for its shareholders, but at the same time also create value for the communities where it operates and for society at large. How, in fact, interact with society is summarized in this pyramid. It's obviously with compliance. And with compliance, we don't just mean compliance with laws and regulations. This should be obvious. It also means compliance with internal codes of conduct, and such as the um, UN Global Compact, and our own business principles and values. Having prints and values means not to do everything that might be legal. In tax optimization is a reason such example, which we clearly reject. Another example is our Nestle environmental requirements, which we prescribe in, where we describe in detail the quality, for example, of air emissions and water that leaves our production sites. These go significantly beyond the legal requirements in many countries, and sometimes these create interesting discussions between us here, me as a head office representative, and the heads of our local operations. I may questions like, why should I invest in a water treatment plant if legally not required, if my competitors are not doing it, and even the local communities where we operate don't even have one? Well, the answer is exactly because you are part of the Nestle family and because it creates uh, shared value. Often in such cases where we are the first, for example, to inaugurate an industrial water treatment plant in a country or in a region, and uh, the first one actually we put in Switzerland in 1930, which happened to be the first industrial wastewater treatment plant in the country, the government officials uh, would come a while after the inauguration back uh, to us to visit together with some competitors and tell them, look, Nestle can do this. We expect it from you as well. This leads to raising the bar for everyone. And it may have started as a term financial burden, turns into a competitive advantage over time. You see with this example also that the borders between compliance and sustainability are not necessarily very rigid. Someone recently actually mentioned that today's sustainability becomes tomorrow's compliance. Set sustainability apart in our interpretation is essentially the longer term focus and the consideration for future generations with a strong focus on environmental and resource aspects. At the top of the pyramid, the shared value has two meanings. It is our 
basic way of doing business, a guiding principle. But company or organization can, can adopt creating shared value as a guiding principle. And many indeed have done so as the increasing popularity of CSV shows. Yet, create shared value is also a way to focus on what matters most to our particular circumstances, to our business model and priorities. In this sense, the specific application of the create value lens is unique to every uh, individual company. And in fact, our different business units use different interpretations of our common corporate focus areas, as we will see uh, in a moment. When analyzing our capacity to create value, we identified three areas where shareholder interest and society's interest intersect most significantly, and where consequently also uh, value creation can be optimized for both. We invest, therefore, resources, uh, both in terms of financial capital and human capital and talent, where the potential for this joint value creation is greatest, and we actively also see collaboration with stakeholders in those areas. Now, when we did this analysis a few years ago, we actually concluded that there were three areas where our joint value creation is greatest. One is nutrition, because obviously food and nutrition are the basics of health and our business, the reason why we exist. Water, because the quality and availability of water is critical to life in general, but also to the production of food and to our operations and to the preparation of food by our consumers. And lastly, rural development, because in the end, the overall well-being of farmers, of rural communities, of suppliers are essential if we want to continue to also do business in future. Let me just uh, briefly go a little bit deeper in each of these three areas. Not surprisingly, obviously, for a food and beverage company, the most important focus area is nutrition. For many years, our corporate strategy has been built and executed around those two objectives of developing products that are tastier and healthier. And like shareholder interest and societal interest, the pair of taste and health in relation to food has mostly been seen in an antagonistic perspective. What is hasty cannot be healthy and the other way around. Lastly, we often talk about the ambition to be an end company, create value for shareholder and for society simultaneously on food and beverages that are tasty and healthy at the same time. Now, this kind of squaring of the circle obviously isn't as easy, and we have developed a set of tools that help us getting as close as possible. This process also requires to take a long-term view and a small enough steps in order not to lose your consumers, because in the end, the healthiest product is little use, both for our shareholders and for society at large, if consumers stop buying it. As a company with the by far broadest product portfolio in the uh, food and beverage uh, uh, sector, we have decided not to go the easy way and to dispose of product categories that may currently not be perceived as, as healthy. We're convinced that most categories indeed uh, will be able to play a positive role in the future, and if they are enhanced through science and technology and in accompanied by responsible consumer communication and behavior. One example here is where we have mapped efficiencies in micronutrients in populations around the globe in areas like zinc, iron, and iodine, which are amongst, and, and, and vitamin A, which are amongst the most common ones. These deficiencies lead to severe illnesses in many parts of the world, and its effect slow down the development of entire societies. The obvious intersection between societal and public health interests and our business interests is to look for ways to enhance our existing products with exactly those micronutrients. Let's take Maria as an example. In this year alone, we sell 80 million bouillon cubes, 
every single day. These bouillon cubes, cooking aids, are used to flavor almost every meal in almost every household. They're very affordable. And it is therefore pristined as an almost ideal carrier for low-cost and affordable nutritional supplementation that improves the health of all segments of society and of the population over time. We're still at the beginning of documenting those public health benefits with hard scientific data, but the trend is clear. Companies like Nestle will not only increasingly contribute to solving public health issues, science and technology will also increasingly help us to identify and quantify this societal return on invested capital. Another example is the use of plant proteins. The question here is how can we improve nutrition without a massive environmental impact? And obviously, some foods require more land, more water to produce more greenhouse gases than others. You have here an example of the water impact of different foods, ranging from the highest impact, which is beef, to the least impact, which is uh, oil crops, lentils, vegetables, and so on. And uh, just you know, looking at it, it is clear that if everyone, one of the seven billion consumers are currently in the world would consume as much beef as, for example, the U.S. currently does, this would require significant additional resources. The good news is that not everyone has to consume that much more meat to get all the nutrition that is required. Many sources of those affordable and nutritious plant proteins that can be used to develop great tasting complements to the occasional uh, meat. Now, this me to the second focus area, which is water. Why is water so central for us? Well, certainly not because Nestle is the largest bottler of drinking water. Providing water in bottles only represents 0.004% of all the, all the companies together, not just Nestle, of the world's freshwater withdrawals. And while there might be some legitimate discussions around potential competition for water resources in some local areas, Globally speaking, the bottled water business certainly is insignificant purely from a quantitative perspective. Our food factories, in fact, use more water than our bottling activities, essentially for things like cleaning, cooking, and cooling. Most water then in our operations is returned back to nature, either as treated processed water or through evaporation. We have reduced the amount of water we use in our facilities facilities over the past decade from around 8 liters per kilogram of product manufactured to less than 3 liters per kilogram today. Our business has grown by 73% in volume terms over those past 10 years. This dramatically increased water efficiency translates to an absolute reduction of water withdrawals, including for bottle activities, by 28% during the same period continue to use water in our operations even further. And one example is our milk factories. As I think by now you already know, milk powder is one of our most important categories. The industrial process there is quite simple. We buy fresh milk from farmers, then separate the milk solids from water using various technologies such as condensating, evaporating, spray drying. And while past most of this, what we call crisp water, uh, ended up as processed water in our treatment facilities, we now employ increasingly sophisticated technologies like reverse osmosis and ultrafiltration to reduce fresh water intake. Ultimately, we aim to completely replace fresh water intake in those milk powder factories that are located in areas of high water stress and water scarcity. But even our total direct water use would by far not justify making water our number one environmental sustainability priority. The real, impact and real concern comes, in fact, from farming. Irrigated farming represents approximately 70% of global freshwater withdrawals. And as we purchase roughly 1% of the world's traded farming output, the indirect water use that is represented through our products is several hundred times bigger than our direct water used in our factories. On an aggregate level, globally, 
the, the world already uses 10% more water what is naturally replenished. And significantly more than those 10% overdraft uh, in many of today's bread and rice baskets. According to the World Bank's Water Resources Group, the shortfall between sustainable supply and demand will even grow to 40% within the next 20 years unless urgent measures are taken. However, unsustainable water use is still not high enough on the public agenda for many reasons, one of them being that it's mostly invisible. The invisible part like the Aral Sea or Lake Chad that have shrunk by more than 90%, but most of the overdraft comes from invisible underground water reserves, from water that in fact has been deposited underground in previous ice ages. And like fossil fuels, once this fossil fresh water has been pumped up, it will be gone forever. So to fossil fuels, which end up as carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and also in the oceans, fossil fresh water eventually ends up as salt water in the oceans too. And much agricultural productivity gains, which we've been seeing during the second half of the 20th century, during the Green Revolution, was due to irrigation. If this irrigation water now becomes depleted or severely polluted, we may see serious impacts on food security, as you can see here also from this quote by the former director of the International Water Management Institute. Therefore, a perfect example for convergence of societal interest and also our corporate interest. No water means no food, which basically means no Nestle. So that's one of the key reasons why our chairman, uh, Peter Brabeck, has dedicated a large part of his time over already the past 10 years to raising awareness about the global water crisis and also now as chairman of the World Bank's 2030 Water Resources Group to promote practical solutions for tackling the complex uh, uh, water issues. In our supply chain, we are promoting more sustainable water use in many ways, most directly through our network of more than 1,000 agronomists uh, who are assisted by another about 17,000 uh, agricultural support staff. And that brings me now to our third and final focus area within our Great and Shared Value Framework, Rural Development. Quickly, as you have seen, we've been close to supply chains as most of our factories were at least originally built in rural areas, close to the perishable agricultural raw materials that we make available as convenient products to consumers in urban centers. For presence, we have developed close relationships with some 670,000 farmers directly and up to 20 million farmers through our extended supply chains. Part of our business model, especially on milk, is around creating milk districts, which is based on what already existed in the 19th century in our home country here in Switzerland. Now, there was a certain trend towards commoditizing raw materials during the earlier days of globalization. But this pendulum is now swinging back because people realize that if you want to differentiate your products, you have to know your ingredients. You have to make sure that you get the best quality when you need it and also in the quantity uh, you need it. Traditionally, our agricultural services focus predominantly on quality because obviously higher quality raw materials makes it easier to make high quality products in our factories. And increasingly, now the focus is also further expanding to making sure we get the right quantities, and in particular, in helping farmers uh, farming in a more sustainable way. As the age of farmers is steadily increasing in most parts of the world, farming not being seen as an attractive vocation for the younger generations, we must therefore make farming more interesting, more profitable, and if we want to supply uh, an increasing and increasingly affluent and demanding global population with high quality food and beverages. And those farmers who stay on their land, often they switch to crops that are more profitable in the short term, for example, switching from cocoa farming uh, to palm oil, uh, as you can hear, see here with some of the uh, fine handles uh, of those product categories. Now, as we are the by far most diversified food company, buying almost every kind of agricultural product, 
we don't have an interest in playing one type of raw material against another. Our goal is that all raw material can be produced in a way that provide a decent living for the farmers. As every business category has its own dedicated and tailor-made uh, way towards creating shared value. For example, the cornerstones of the Nestle Cocoa Plan and also the Nescafe Plan are to provide better plants, better crops, which we offer to farmers to replace their aging, poor yielding and disease prose plantations. The challenge is enormous. In West Africa alone, about one billion cocoa trees need to be replaced within the next 10 years. We provided more than one million trees last year alone, which was a major undertaking given the logistical challenges involved in some of those countries. And we are definitely committed to further scaling up our program. Obviously, some of our competitors are doing their part too, which is great, because it requires a major scaling up of efforts uh, by everyone to help farmers getting better yields, getting better incomes in a more sustainable way. A part of our development focus is our responsible sourcing program, where we are aligning our triple bottom line objectives with those societal trends like resource scarcity, like also much stronger society engagement through social media today, rising consumer awareness, and uh, last but not least, also increasing regulations uh, and other types of standards. Responsible sourcing is at the very start of the value chain with the ultimate goal to delight our consumers. Approximately 15% of those raw materials which we purchase uh, are done through the Net Sustainable Agriculture Initiative and through a program that is called Farmer Connect, where we engage directly uh, with these over 670,000 farmers, uh, with these agronomists and supply chain support staff I mentioned, mainly around resources like coffee, cocoa, milk, fruits, and vegetables. Beyond Farmer Connect, we then establish increasingly closer links with our direct or tier one suppliers. All of these suppliers are contractually bound by Nestle supplier code, and we have audited more than 3,000 of them uh, by the end of 2012. And in addition to that, we started a traceability program in 2010, focusing on about 12 uh, uh, high priority categories to get full traceability to the farm level. Categories are also then supported with very specific uh, guidelines uh, that are specific to the individual materials. After the overview of our three focus areas, let's now take a slightly different uh, perspective and look at our activities through the lens of what are the motivations, what are the reasons, the drivers uh, for our environmental and sustainability improvements. And we've come up with three complementary drivers. Number one, compliance, which is what we have to do simply to be in business today. Basically, there we don't have any choice, whether it's imposed by law or even more importantly for us, self-imposed by our own values through the Nestle corporate business principles. The second part, competitive advantage, is what we should be doing because it makes business sense today, the famous business case for sustainability. I'll come back to that in a moment. But also bear in mind the longer-term view, was essentially, essentially what we must do if we still want to have a successful business in 150 years from now. Now, focusing on the business case, traditionally, we have been concentrating mostly on cost savings from operations because this can be quite accurately uh, quantified. And very often now there's a clear payback if you save greenhouse gases, you save energy and vice versa. If you reduce waste, you take out waste of the system. It's good for shareholders and that's good for the environment uh, at the same time. So we've got various programs, lean war and, or war and waste and so on. Increasingly, there is also now an awareness that we can use environmental and social societal benefits related to our products to offer the peace mind as an additional benefit to consumers that drives preference for our products. In this sense, delighting consumers 
which products that are better for the environment and for society also becomes a competitive advantage. Now, these two inner circles, compliance and the business case, are not primarily motivated by sustainability, by long-term considerations, but they obviously contribute to sustainability. Where third and outer circle there is motivated essentially by the desire to continue our business over the long term by sustainability, not compromising the livelihood of future generations. Critical question now for any company and for society as a whole to ask is if we do everything to be compliant and if we do everything that gives us a tangible competitive advantage in our business case in the short to medium term, is there still a sustainability gap left? And so how do we quantify that? And how do we measure whether our activities are sustainable giving that broader framework I discussed at the beginning of dwindling resources, of resource constraints, of scarcities? And given that, how do we know whether we do carry our fair share as part of wider society? Now, a way of looking at that is to uh, look at this graph that has been drawn up a few years ago by PricewaterhouseCoopers, where they calculated the required efficiency gains year after year to get to a situation by 2050 where greenhouse gas emissions are limited to a level that make the climate uh, change still halfway manageable. And when they did that first in the year 2000, they came up with a figure of 3.7% improvement per year, year after year. In the latest publication just recently, uh, they now assessed the, the actual performance of the past few years and realized, well, the actual performance was only 0.8%, a significant shortfall, which means if we want to make up for the lost decade in a way, we have now year after year for the next uh, 37 years improve on average as a world society, global society, by 5.1%. Now, how are we doing against that? Well, one way of looking at that is to look at our resource consumption. And we've got figures spanning more than the past decade, uh, but uh, a reasonably reliable uh, figure for the last 10 years that showed that we have increased our production volume, and that's now in, in tonnage rather than in financial metrics uh, to take the exchange rate um, uh, volatilities out from the equation there. 73% more goods produced physically, while at the same time we have reduced uh, greenhouse gas emissions in our factories by 17%. And that tr translates roughly into an improvement of carbon intensity of about 5%. So it seems we're doing, or we have been doing reasonably well. The challenge obviously is to maintain this improvement also for the next few decades. And don't just take my word for uh, this. Uh, this has also been externally recognized. Uh, the, that's uh, the graph here from the latest carbon disclosure project uh, ranking where we're the joint number one together with uh, Bayer, uh, the healthcare company, and according to the rate, the Reuters report, uh, CDP is the most credible of these various rating uh, initiatives. Now, these figures I've showed you here uh, only take account of our direct business impact from manufacturing, but trees are only one aspect which are the most tightly controllable by, by any company. But we need to look beyond. We need to look at the entire life cycle of our uh, product. And we've done several hundreds of uh, these LCAs uh, over the last few years. Let me just share you very high level uh, one example, Nescafe. Uh, while we made significant improvement on the manufacturing side, which is represented in blue here, and also in packaging optimization, increasingly using uh, refill packs, for example, we must have years ago that the major impact in this particular category is at the consumer side. The initial action was, well, actually we can't really do too much about that, but however then we realized soon that most consumers boil more water than what is needed. If you know that every single second 5,000 cups of Nescafe are being prepared and drunk every second, 
Well, we did the calculation that if everyone bought only twice the amount of water, uh, which is probably a conservative estimate, this is more energy than all of our 27 Nescafe factories uh, consume. So with simple improvements like this uh, eco kettle uh, that has been launched by a company in the UK, um, everyone can make with a little gesture uh, their contribution and 5,000 Nescafés or a cup of tea or whatever you want being prepared uh, in addition to, to the cups of Nescafé every second makes a major contribution to resource efficiency. Even more interesting uh, things become if you compare soluble coffee with other ways of prepare, preparing coffee. For example, the old-fashioned traditional filtered coffee. Obviously, our industrial coffee machines, as you would expect, are much more sophisticated uh, and much more efficient than just letting water percolate uh, through a filter. Uh, it's an example of economies and efficiencies of scale and hence also a good example of creating shared value. Nescafe obviously is a product with good profitability, which is based on R&D-driven technological and efficiency advantages, and at the same time it saves resources, which is obviously good for the environment. You can see here at the bottom, let me just try to use this pointer here, on the left-hand side here, uh, it's traditional filter coffee, the CO2 impact on the right-hand side here, that's the Nescafe impact. And the same goes here for water consumption and biodiversity. Uh, me to waste uh, and resource e efficiency uh, in general, which is really becoming a major theme along the entire value chain. Far too much food is being wasted either by consumers because despite recent food price increases in many parts of the population uh, today, there is a much smaller percentage of income uh, spent on food than ever before. And with the limited resources uh, the world has available, I don't believe that this trend to ever cheaper food uh, can continue, especially when at the same time you know that up to a third of the food that actually purchased, uh, that, that comes into consumer hands, is finally uh, not eaten. So the food sector has a central role to play to further optimize efficiencies all along the value chain. And in this context, obviously, and as the Nescafe Eco cattle example has shown, uh, sustainability cannot be managed in isolation by companies alone. To create truly shared value, all stakeholders have to play their part. We are therefore engaging increasingly with consumers through a variety of means and on a very broad range of topics. We call this approach tastier and healthier about our products directly, as well as on the right-hand side here, and so much more. Being a decentralized uh, company with multiple products, uh, we have deliberately decided to leave a large degree of freedom to our different categories. The Nescafe plan, for example, focuses on the quality of the cup, but also on the quality beyond the cup. It starts with responsible farming, addresses responsible production, and engages with consumers also on responsible consumption, uh, as, uh, as I have referred in some of the examples. The uh, Nespresso case, which is one of our other major coffee brands, uh, the origin of the pre premium coffees is even more important. And in this particular case, obvious focus areas include also recycling of the capsules and the design of, raw, uh, of the um, coffee machines. The umbrellas throughout our Nespresso value chain is e-collaboration. Our activities around chocolate are supported by the Nestle Cocoa Plan, um, again focusing very much on sourcing and providing assistance to farmers. You can read more. Uh, details on our respective uh, websites. But in addition to the websites and the limited space that is available uh, on on-pack information, we increasingly use social media and in particular smartphone applications. More and more of our products will contain quick reference uh, or QR codes, which can be easily scanned and links to a wealth of nutritional, environmental, and societal information. For example, this milk powder, uh, here you can learn about life cycle, about our improvements, 
uh, for example, that has been produced in an ISO 14,000 uh, certified trees. By the way, all of the Nestle factories are certified to environmental and safety and health standards. Uh, so that, that one kilo of this product uh, generates greenhouse gases equivalent uh, to driving 1.6 kilometers with a standard passenger car and requires 31 liters of water. Creating complete transparency is key for us to enable informed consumer choice. It is very important for us, however, that we, uh, we avoid the pitfalls of greenwashing. All the information we provide is guided by the principle uh, that it has to be scientifically sound and not misleading or misrepresenting uh, the facts. Basically, all of that happens in a complex ecosystem of partners and stakeholders who constantly challenge us and help us to get even better in the future. And in this spirit, I'm now looking forward to your comments and uh, questions. And just before handing back uh, to Elise and Vanessa, let me just summarize. Our sustainability and creating shared value approach is an integral and undissociable part of our strategy. Our aim is to delight our consumers with products that are not only tastier and healthier, but they also create value for society at large in many different facets, and at the same time preserve natural resources also for future generations. That is what we mean by a good, good, good life. So thanks for your interest, for listening in, and I now hand back to Elise. Thank you. Thank you very much, Klaus. That was really, really interesting and triggered a lot of questions. So um, I will read them out and, um, and take them. I don't know if we'll have the time to respond to all of them, but take them one by one. Uh, one question from Gavin Milligan. Are investors demonstrating a willingness to accept long-term returns? How is this changing over time? Right. Uh, that's. Am I on again now? Yes, I think. Yeah, that's a really interesting one. And it's also why I had, uh, at the beginning, deliberately mentioned our Articles of Association. Now, we're very consciously, a few years ago, we included the goal of long-term sustainable value creation in our business purpose. And when our CEO and uh, Chief Financial Officer meet the financial communities, and obviously sometimes uh, are being pressured uh, to increase uh, share value in the short term. Uh, for example, like in the 1990s, it has been very um, fashionable for many European companies to get listed on the New York Stock Exchange uh, in order to make their sales more tradable uh, and uh, to, to, to increase basically the demand for those European shares. The negative side was that you then had to um, be part of that dictate, uh, of that tyranny almost of quarterly um, financial uh, information and reporting, which already there in the 1990s, Nestle had taken a very clear stance and they said, no, no, we're not doing that, which had depressed, in fact, our share, uh, our share value for a number of years. But as I think over the last 10 years, also our share development has shown very, very nicely that some of those companies who took a very short-term uh, investor or overly investor oriented uh, point of view, uh, well, their share value uh, hasn't really done as well as, uh, as ours. And so um, very often our CEO and CFO, when confronted with this, they take out the articles of association, read them out to, uh, to the investors and tell them, look, if you want to, if you speculate, uh, if you want to gamble, uh, then go and purchase other shares of other companies. We don't even want you as an investor. We want to have investors that understand our business model uh, and uh, that are in it for, for the long term. So yes, it's not always easy, and it, uh, it takes quite some, some, some guts uh, and also probably some, some historic momentum to be able to do that. So I would not necessarily recommend it to every company, but uh, uh, that's definitely our experience in this area. Thank you. Another question from Hans Czech. The coffee sounds nice, but why is Nestle selling the espresso coffee powder in an can proportion, producing a high value to trash? Uh, sorry, yes, here. Uh, the coffee example sounds nice, but why is Nestle selling espresso? Right, yes. 
Um, interesting and obviously um, to, to keep things short, I only showed a very simplified version of the life cycle assessment where I was only um, showing the Nescafe and then the other example was a comparison to traditional roast and ground coffee, yeah, which uh, Nespresso is also roast and ground coffee. But interestingly enough, if you do a comparison between Nespresso and traditional filter coffee, despite the additional environmental impact, uh, which uh, undeniably the, these capsules have, due to the higher efficiency of the extraction yield that the whole system around the machine that comes with a 19 bar pump, and we're through this uh, integrated system of capsule and uh, uh, dedicated coffee machines, the extraction yield is optimized that not only you get more goodness out of the, the coffee, and so you can do more with less, at the same time you also get a much better tasting uh, product, which is again, I think, a classical example for creating shared value because the end product is better. And if you do an independent and it's independently uh, uh, ISO verified third party uh, assessed um, uh, life cycle assessment, which we have there and which we can make uh, available, it's actually available on our website for those people who have a, a specific interest in the, the detailed assessments there. The bottom line is that even Obviously, given the fact that uh, the, the, the capsules are recycled uh, to, a, to a large degree, uh, which we're doing very, very much in, in, in most countries and still scaling up uh, a recycling of these aluminium capsules in, in, in other parts of the world, uh, is actually even Nespresso, despite the capsules, uh, has a lower overall environmental impact than traditional filter coffee. And uh, that came even uh, as a big surprise to us when we did that uh, LCA uh, or commissioned that LCA by an independent uh, organization a few years ago. Okay, thank you. And if I can just remind the audience to try to ask your question using the Q&A box and instead of the chat box, that would be, that would be great. Um, another question from Angela Corridor of Viedo. Why do you think the corporate world hasn't fully embraced the concept of shared value? And what do you think they require to make it part of the business strategy? Well, it's obviously difficult for me to address because we have very much uh, not only embraced the concept, uh, but in fact it was even our chairman a few years ago at the Davos World Economic Forum uh, that starts again in a, in a couple of weeks' time where, uh, in fact, uh, some people were going around and said, well, we have to give back to society uh, and to do more corporate social responsibility. And our chairman at the, at the time deliberately, uh, obviously a bit provocatively, said, well, I don't actually think we need to give back to society yeah, because we haven't really taken anything away from them in the first place uh, because the way we run our business and have been running it long before before we called it creating shared value, it was just sort of been an academic uh, uh, sort of framework uh, that happened to be developed by, by Michael Porter and Mark Kramer. Uh, um, but we've basically been doing business like that for, for, for many, many decades. Uh, that by the way we do business, value is created not only for shareholders and uh, uh, but also for uh, for stakeholders for society at large. And what I believe probably still happens too much in, in, in some companies maybe is to say, well, we focus on making as much money as we can uh, and uh, then in good years uh, when the profits are good, we're, we're giving some of that away in a, in a charitable uh, way as, as, as corporate social responsibility. And I think that's really the difference of uh, between creating shared value and corporate social responsibility that you integrate it into your uh, business strategy, and obviously we hope that by uh, sharing some of our examples and our approaches in events like this one, so we, we maybe can inspire uh, some other uh, companies and institutions to uh, to reflect what that uh, would mean for them. Thank you, and on that note, uh, there's a question about this link between the, the joint benefits for Monelli and for, for the society. So how does NEF measure these shared values? For, for the company and for society? So that's actually quite a tricky one, uh, and uh, that's one which, I, as I said before, uh, we're still at the beginning uh, of that. Uh, we were working together with uh, some, some consultancies, uh, some academics to, to track and to, uh, to measure that, but it's obviously not with that easy. 
easy, especially in the social area where things obviously take, uh, take time. Uh, maybe one area where we have many, many years already of experience, it's uh, more in the nutritional side, um, which was an experimentation that was set up in France and where Nestle was one of several uh, contributors uh, uh, and participants to, where two villages uh, in, in neighboring villages close by were studied over time in terms of childhood obesity and child nutritional uh, status, where the children in one part were very much uh, sort of exposed to nutritional information, uh, where the other one was basically just your, your typical control group, and where it was clearly demonstrated uh, over time that the one group uh, that was more exposed to um, reflecting more about nutrition, uh, to, to eating more consciously, and that's why uh, something which I hadn't really mentioned, uh, but which is another example on our uh, nutrition side, where not sponsoring uh, in terms of marketing terms uh, uh, educational campaigns uh, that that probably would not be very equal uh, but we are using and we're leveraging our nutritional knowledge together with government bodies with international with with uh, independent and also international organizations uh, uh, to make more of that nutrition uh, knowledge uh, available but obviously you can't really do easy control groups like that uh, uh, every time because at the same time you obviously also want uh, the maximum of consumers to benefit from that. So it's an interesting uh, topic, which uh, which will uh, I've, I've got a specific project on that this year, which will probably keep me pretty busy. And uh, maybe uh, in a year or two, uh, we can do another webinar uh, once we have uh, learned a bit more about that aspect too. That'll be really interesting uh, because I, yeah, I think we all understand it's it's a it's a difficult point to measure, of course. Um, another question, maybe a challenging one, but I. Think I think it's worth asking. Uh, Carolina Villamil asks that Nestle is a big company and needs a huge amount of agricultural materials, materials for mass consumption and profits. How can mass consumption, material extraction, sustainability, and social well-being be on the same table? How, how do you have you think of? Um, uh, do you, I mean, talking about the consumption, is it uh, anything to reduce consumption? Is that something? To discussing how, how do you address these different, sometimes very opposite concepts together? Right, it's a, it's a very, very relevant uh, question indeed. And being in the food business, uh, it is probably much easier to uh, to address that and to comment on that than if you would be in some kind of other consumer gadget business where. Uh, you, you truly can ask yourself, uh, do you really always need the very latest version of the whatever gadget you, you, you may have uh, with all the uh, extract, material extraction uh, and uh, throwaway mentality that comes with that? Now, food is slightly different uh, because obviously everyone uh, needs to eat uh, and everyone needs to have their 2,000 uh, roughly calories uh, a day. And the question is, how do we do that in the most sustainable way, uh, in the most nutritious way? Uh, now, has said that, even the food industry uh, has its own challenges, uh, and uh, uh, obesity uh, and uh, overeating clearly is part of that. And while in the past uh, we did have packages uh, and also maybe some uh, marketing incentives uh, to 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 encourage people to buy more of our products, we have significantly evolved uh, our um, our strategies over the last few years in this area. We have limited portion sizes. Uh, we bring more small portion sizes, uh, which is also uh, very relevant now uh, in reducing food waste uh, because if people buy larger quantities, then they don't eat everything uh, and the rest is thrown away and so on. Uh, so portion, portion size, portion control is a very, very important part. And we definitely do not do not want to grow our business through volume, uh, so by selling more stuff, uh, but our strategy as being the most resource and development and innovation intensive uh, uh, company in the in the food sector, uh, clearly we want to be doing it through innovation, through technology, through adding value. Uh, in particular, I mean, there is one new business area where we are just starting to invest in it, which will take probably many, many years until we see uh, significant benefits there, which is, again, another 
area of, of long-term perspective where we want to tailor food to very specific nutritional and even health needs of certain populations uh, to prevent the offset of certain diseases and in the in the long term even to uh, to some diseases because certainly also the whole healthcare system is not sustainable and through a healthier diet uh, you can probably uh, contribute very significantly by uh, by adding value to food uh, where when then you end up paying less for uh, pharmaceuticals and uh, healthcare treatments. Thank you very much, Klaus. For, for all these useful responses. There are a few other questions, but unfortunately I, I'm just aware of time and I think uh, we should close here. If there is a burning question, I'm very happy to uh, forward them to Klaus so you can send it to my email um, at the end of this presentation. But uh, yeah, really, thank you Klaus. It was, a, it was a great presentation. It was really useful. And uh, uh, yeah, of course, if you have additional and uh, additional information to share in a few months about your research that that would be that would be and we'd be happy to um to share that um just a few notes yeah there there were a question about the slides so the slides will be shared um on two degree website and on wwf website after this session and there were a question about our work wwf works uh with Nestle. so i will also include some information about our, our collaboration with Nestle uh, on our website, so you have information. A lot of information about what is next. So the next On Planet webinar will take place on the 12th of February at the same time, so 12.30 European time. Uh, we have a great pleasure to welcome Ian Sheshire, who is the CEO of Future, and he tell us more about the new uh, net positive strategy of things which seeks to go beyond neutrality and from the business in a positive for, for, for good. So I very much look forward to seeing you again in about a month from now. Uh, I hand over back to Vanessa. Is there anything additional you want to say? Yeah, thanks so much. So um, I guess this is pretty much our wrap up right now. I'd like to thank both Elise and Klaus for joining us today. Thank you very much for the presentation, Klaus, and Elise for um, moderating and managing today. Um, for all the attendees out there, the recording and the relevant info will be posted shortly on the Managing Sustainability Group. We'll also be sending a follow-up email with these relevant links, so you'll be able to catch it there. Um, so now with that out of the way, I'd like to thank everyone for joining, and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.